Let's talk amps, ohms, and volts on the vehicle now. Now I've got the most negative thing on the vehicle, the battery post negative with the black lead. Red lead is just on the positive post, so we're just looking at open circuit voltage on the battery. Surface uh, charge has been removed after the headlights have been on for about 20 seconds. That's off now, 12.64 volts. We are looking at a fully charged battery at 70 degrees Fahrenheit ambient temperature. Let's go ahead and start it up. Let's look at charging voltage. We're going to move on some more in-depth, high-end stuff as we go in the next two or three minutes. Okay, we got this little two-liter GDI running. Charging voltage 13.8. Everything looks cool there. Now, if you had a charging system analyzer, great, hook it up. If you don't have one handy, you can use an inductive amp clamp. Now, there's a lot of different ones in the market. This little guy right here, up to 600 amps, great for starter draw. Get an adapter, plug it into your lab scope, do relative compression testing. Now, this little guy, not gonna get around too many big wires, gonna be more like for fuel pumps and things. Uh, some of you high-end techs are gonna have the one that plugs right into your Pico scope or other type lab scope. With the BNC, there's a BNC back to banana plugs, you can plug right into your voltmeter leads for millivolts, converting millivolts to amps with the inductive amp clamp. Now I'm going to go ahead and do a little cheating. This guy is fairly accurate under 100 milliamps, which is very unusual for an amp clamp with jaws that big. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. Comes on to about 4 amps. I'm going to hit the zero button. So we're all zeroed out. Open the clamps up a couple, three or four times and make sure we can get it as parallel to the cable like that, perpendicular I should say, as possible. Now, because you're not going to be able to see it, what I'm going to do, I'm going to hit that hold button and take a little capture of what the current draw is right out of that positive battery cable. All right, so it beeped back at me and now we have oh, about five amps. Now, if I had turned the amp clamp the other way, 180, it would say positive, but we're putting five amps into that battery from the charging system in addition to whatever current the alternator is putting out for the accessories. All right, so that's a quick and dirty way we can look at charging system. Let's go beyond that. Let's look at ripple voltage. We're going to look at the AC component of where the diodes have not fully rectified AC back to DC. Now that should be lower than 0.5 or one half of a volt of AC. So we're going to go right here where I'm positive DC, let's go to AC, and this is a true RMS meter, so it's doing 0.707% or 70% of the peak to peak that you'd see on a, on a sine wave on a scope. So we're about 20 millivolts of AC, so that's well under 500 millivolts or a half of a volt of AC. They all vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but half a volt or 500 millivolts of AC is the standard max. You want much lower than that to prevent those phantom problems of ripple voltage. Unrectified AC slipping into that DC and playing havoc with your electronics. So that's looking good. Now let's look at some min-max features and duty cycle and frequency and maybe one or two tips that you advanced guys are waiting on that maybe you've never looked into. So we're going to have pop out our positive here. Just leave the alligator on there. Pull that out. I'm going to go over here and take a look at the coil on plug. I got a cop over here. I got power. Let's go ahead and turn it back up to voltage with a little red acupuncture back probe. And we're seeing battery voltage or charging system voltage available to the coil. So if we had a problem, if let's say we saw 10, what we'd want to do is we want to move the negative lead over to positive like so and see the voltage drop or the difference between battery positive at the battery post and the feed to the cop. And it should be typically less than one or two tenths for the total for the entire circuit, a half a volt being way more than you want to see a voltage drop. And we're looking at not even one tenth of one volt. So we have good voltage drop on a circuit that's working, got current through it, the coil obviously is operating, we don't have a misfire, so that's good. Now let's do the same thing with the ground. So there's two ways to do a voltage drop. You can just look at the circuit voltage and see if it's different than measured battery voltage, the circuit in question, or 
what I like to do is just go across two points that should be the same value. The battery should be at positive 12 and show, so should the feed to the coil be at positive 12, so the difference should be zero. As we saw earlier, it was like less than one tenth. Now, let's go ahead and look at the negative side here. So my lead on my black wire is on the negative post of the battery. I go to the negative feed, the solid ground feed. Oh, that's rock solid, okay. When you don't see the bar graph moving back and forth, rock solid, and you see a real low voltage, we're going now between a negative feed to the coil on plug and the negative post battery cable. Those two points should both be negative, so you should see no difference. No voltage potential, zero volts, that's what we're seeing. The fact it's not shattering back and forth tells us this is not a digital circuit. So we're not on the wire accidentally that's being toggled on and off the ground by the ECM making the coil work. Let's go ahead and go to that wire now. So we're seeing no voltage drop on the power, no voltage drop on the ground, so far so good. Let's go on the trigger wire or that digital signal from the ECM. So black lead, battery positive, po negative post, battery negative post, red lead is what's being toggled on and off by the computer to ground. So we're seeing a lot of activity there and a lot of times we just give up at that point. I don't want to get the scope out, I don't have a scope. Go ahead and use your digital feature of this meter. I'm going to change it from volts to duty cycle. Now I see 18%. If I rev the engine up, it should change. Change. All right. Even just coming back as the engine is slowed down, I can see it change down to like 19 or 18. It went up as I sped the engine up. So our duty cycle change, our hertz, I'm sorry, frequency, time per second change, hit it again, we'll see the duty cycle. So it's on about 3% of the time at about 18 hertz at idle, goes up with the engine going up, as you would expect with a digital signal that's making that coil toggle on and off. Now, if I just wanted to see if it, is it coming down to ground fully, a scope would be the best way to do that, but we could go back to voltage. There's where it's busy, it's all over the place. Let's min-max it. So when I hit the min-max button, the max was 0.3, the min was 0 0.018. It went fully to ground. Now 0.3 wasn't very high because we never turned it off that, for that long a period of time. However, let's change the update rate or the sampling rate. We'll squeeze it down. Now this meter won't show us the change from 100 millisecond sampling time of mid-max to one millisecond. But if I hit the same button I could hit on the earlier Fluke 87, audible beep symbol for a continuity test. Right above it, it says peak min max. That's going to bring this slash five series Fluke 87, the later models of Fluke 87s, into a 250 microsecond. Let's see what difference it makes. So we'll go ahead. We've seen we had 0.19 for the ground and the max was 0.3. All right, let's get it out of min max range, back into it. Hit that min max peak button. All right now we're in peak mode. So we're going as high as four volts. From four volts down to point two. So we're seeing the ground, point two, we're seeing as high as four volts, which makes more sense. So the next best thing to a scope is a meter that can not only read duty cycle and frequency, but also read a higher degree of accuracy, if you know what the buttons do, for a peak min max or a 250 microsecond sampling rate. Let's go ahead and take a peek at a resistance test. Now normally we're going to do a resistance test and let's say I want to check a ground wire. Now you know if you're going to check maybe the resistance or continuity of a wire, we'll say for example my alternator output which a voltage drop would be way better. But if you're gonna do a wire like that big red wire from the alternator output to the positive post of battery, just one wire, and you wanna see if it's got good continuity. You not got any resistance in it, you just wanna use a, an ohm meter. They turn this thing to ohms, maybe hook the leads together, 0.4, I'll hit this little relative delta symbol, that's the zero button. There we go, it's zeroed out. Now I'm OL again, out of limits. 
Now I'm back down to 0 .0, 0 .0. Let's show you shut the car off. There you go. All right, now. So the vehicle's dead. Uh, let's hook up to a ground, a known good ground, for example. So I'm going to go to the most grounded thing on the vehicle. That is the battery negative. And I'm going to go over here to this negative battery cable for body grounding right there on the fender. And I'm showing 20 ohms. That's interesting, 20 ohms. That's a good ground wire. I mean, this is a new car. There's no problems. What's up with that? Let's see what happens when I shut the door. 18 ohms. Let's see what happens when I try to speed up the process of the vehicle going to sleep. So it went up momentarily, I hit the horn. What we're doing here is we're using the ohm meter in the improper fashion. You see, just because I wouldn't use an ohm meter in my right mind on a positive circuit, like the alternator output over here to this positive battery kit post, because I know that's a live circuit. Ohm meters put a little voltage out into the circuit and see how much comes back. It's basically doing its little bitty voltage drop test with about two tenths or so of a volt, sometimes two volts, it depends on the meter. So just a small amount of voltage, it exceeds what it gets back. It can't do that if it's got a live circuit. So you may think, well, that's the hot wire. You're on a ground wire. You're on a short wire between this negative post and this spot on the fender. That's not a live wire. Yes, it is. Every electron that comes through the red wires come back to the battery through black wires and through the metal, the chassis ground. So you have a live circuit. You see it starting to come down? If we waited long enough, maybe 20 minutes, that would come down to 0.0, .0 or very, very low. And you'd say, hey, that's a good wire. No resistance in that ground wire. You should take the battery cable off if you're going to use an ohm meter on a vehicle because you don't want any current going through either wire, red or black wires. However, here's the advanced tip. If you have struggled with current draw, parasitic current draw, you don't have a meter that's super accurate, big jaws, grab a battery cable, you gotta mess with taking the cable off, put one of those knife switches in for parasitic current testing, move your meter leads from common and volts over here to amps, and making sure you turn to amps, and then putting the leads between the post and the battery cable, with the cable removed from the post, and then waiting for the current draw to come down. Hopefully you don't have a bad fuse in your meter, which is Murphy's Law, oftentimes you do. If the ohm meter is back to zero on a known good ground circuit, key off, door shut, locked, BCM, everybody trying to go to sleep, when it goes to zero ohms, which now we're still at 15. When that thing goes to zero ohms, that will tell you, I guarantee you, you have no parasitic current draw. But if it doesn't go back, it's 15, it's 10, it's 100 or whatever, then you're justified in getting out the equipment you need to do an advanced parasitic current draw test.